Hi everybody, welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler, and in today's video, we are going to be looking at the bone structure as well as the joints that these bones make up. Now, if you are new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and make sure your notifications are on because I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. Now, in any test or exam, you will be asked to either draw a bone or you're going to need to label it. So we're going to start off with the more macroscopic structures, the structures of the bone that we can see with the naked eye. And then we're going to zoom in on the bone and identify the smaller, more microscopic structures. We're going to start off with this substance over here. And we've actually cut the top half of this bone open so that we can see on the inside of it. But covering the ends of the bone is articulating cartilage. And you can see the cartilage on this diagram as a sort of blue colored substance. This particular cartilage is hairline cartilage. It's smooth. It's glassy. It prevents friction. Then sitting just below that, if we've cut the bone open, you will notice that the inside of the bone is porous. And that part of the bone is spongy bone. And we find spongy bone at the ends of bones. And that brings me then to the name that we give the regions of bones. Now, this top region of the bone or the end of the bone, and it's the same on both ends, is called the epiphysis. Now, also found in the epiphysis, in and amongst the actual spongy bone, is a substance called red bone marrow. Now, red bone marrow is where red blood cells are made. Now, as we move down to the lower portion of the bone, and it's basically the shaft of the bone, this long elongated area, we call that part of the bone the diaphysis, with another epiphysis sitting on the other end to represent the end of the bone. Now, inside the diaphysis, we are going to find numerous substances as well as a substance that covers the entire bone. So let's start off with this outer layer, and they've peeled this outer layer off, so we can see it a bit easier, that is called the periosteum. The periosteum is there for protection, it protects our bones, and the weird thing that also the periosteum do is it makes your bones actually wet. It makes your bones have moisture because they can't be dry. Then if we go into the next layer that we can see just below that, you can see this thicker part of bone, and that is our compact bone. Now, the canal that is sitting in the middle of the bone that you can see here um, has an inner lining, and that inner lining, and I'm going to be very careful to label here as this inner lining over there, that is the endosteum. And as the name suggests, endo means inside, and osteum means bone, just like peri is the outer layer and osteum is bone. Those are the two protective layers. Now, what is the endosteum protecting? On the inside of our long bones, we have another kind of marrow called yellow bone marrow. And yellow bone marrow is there for the production of our immune cells. It's also where we store our um, immunological memory when we have infections. But if we were to now zoom into a piece of bone so we can actually see what it looks like, we're going to zoom in on a piece of the compact bone. So if I were to cut a chunk out of that bone, we're going to now look on the left-hand side here, what does that look like up close? Now, as you can see here, we have a lot of very small structures that are making what we call concentric circles, and they make circles around each other. And what you are looking at here is a Harvesian system. So this entire set of circles wrapping around each other is known as a Harvesian system, or in some textbooks, it's also known as a osteon. And there are many osteons you can see. Here. There's at least four in this diagram. But what actually makes the osteon itself? So let's talk about what's making those circles. If you look very carefully, you will see there are these pink cells that are sitting in the osteon, and those are our osteocytes or our bone cells. And they sit in lines and circles with one another. And so the actual line that they sit in is called the lamella or the lamellae. And essentially, they sit in these circles and they secrete out calcium, phosphorus, and the matrix of bone, and they are responsible for the ones to actually build and maintain the bone. I think we often forget that bone is actually alive. It's not a dead substance. Now, the osteocytes do not just sit in the actual bone. 
what they actually sit in, and it's a little bit unclear in this picture because it's a bit far away, but the actual osteocyte, if I click on and just highlight this one over here, it's actually sitting inside of a space. Now, that space is called a lacana or a lucane, and that is where the osteon um, secretes out of its substances. Remember, it is a form of bone, so we're going to need to have a lucana to put our cells inside of it, just in a similar way that we need a lucana in our cartilage for our uh, chondrocytes or our cartilage cells to sit in. It's a little, a little space, a little cutout for them to sit in. Now, sitting at the center of each of our osteons, you will notice is a collection of blood vessels. And those blood vessels are there in order to bring nutrients um, and to help repair bone if it's broken. And that particular blood vessel or the blood vessels sit in this cylindrical space that runs down the middle of all of our osteons. And so we call that the central canal. Now, moving on to the type of joints that these bones will create. Um, now, remember, we have joints because this is where the intersection of two bones meet. And depending on what part of the body there is and how much movement there needs to be, will determine whether or not where these bones meet will produce one of these three joints. So the first kind of joint we have is a fibrous or an immovable joint. And we see this in our skull between the sutures of all the bony plates of our skull. And they are not movable. They are now fixed in place. They were once separate and now they're fused together. The second kind is the cartilaginous joints, and these are the joints that we are semi-movable, we see in between our vertebral column, and there is a little bit of movement, but you have to agree that the movement in the vertebral column needs to be limited because it's purpose is to provide structure and support. If it's too flexible, you'd never be able to stand upright. You'd be too bendy. Now, the final kind of joint is a synovial or a free moving joint. And we have a lot of different kinds of joints depending on what movement you want to make with that synovial joint, because the plane of movement is important. And when I say plane of movement, I mean, how are you moving the joint? Are you moving it uh, in a circle, like in 360 degrees, or can the joint only move from side to side? Now, the next most important component that we're going to need for any test or exam is knowing how to draw and label a synovial joint. This is, remember, just a general uh, diagram. And what we're going to have to be able to do is identify the structures, starting off with the most simple of that, which is this structure over here, which is the bone. And as you can see, it's two places where bones meet. Now, in between that, we find the actual joint and the synovial membrane. Now, sitting on the very, very outside of this whole structure is the joint capsule. This provides an added extra layer of um, support, but also protection, and it protects the synovial membrane, which sits just inside of that. And that particular membrane is sitting just over here. Now, the point of the membrane is it needs to provide lubrication. It needs to provide a fluid. And as all membranes are generally moist, they have some kind of moisture to them, it prevents any wearing away of the joint. And so that means that this area that is this darker red color is called the synovial fluid. And so that's the fluid that allows the bones to move and glide smoothly past each other. And lastly, to prevent even further friction, we have this layer of cartilage at the ends of your bones, or also known as your articulating cartilage, so that in case the synovial fluid is not in between the two, you also have that extra protection preventing any friction and wearing away of the joint. The next thing you need to be aware of is the different types of synovial joints um, and their locations. Often a common question in an exam is you identify the type of synovial joint and you tell uh, them what uh, direction of movement is happening. Is it a 360 degree rotation? Do they slide over one another? Does it make um, the arm or the leg move up and down, you're going to give the type of movement that's associated with it. Now, the most common type of synovial joint that we do talk about is a ball and socket joint. And as the name describes, uh, it is the end of a bone that is rounded and it sits against another bone that is rounded in the opposite. In other words, it's cut into. 
um, it's a socket. And we see this in our hips, but we also see this in our shoulders, and it allows for 360 degree movement. The next kind of joint that we have is called a hinge. Now, a hinge joint is very common in places where there is only one direction of movement. In other words, you can only move it up and then move it down. And you need to think of this in your elbow. You see this in your knee, your fingers, and your toes. And you're literally hinging the joint away from you and then towards you. The next kind of joint we see is a pivoting joint. And the pivoting joint is, is most frequently seen in our vertebra. And the pivot allows you to rotate. And essentially, we see this, and we've learned this earlier on with the axis and the atlas bones in your vertebra. It allows you to rotate your head left and right. Now, the last three joints, which is the saddle, the plane, and the condyloid joint, are all what we call gliding joints. Basically, it means bones glide over one another in some way. The condyloid joint and the plane joint are two perfect examples of when your bones slide over each other. And a nice way to think of this is when you take your wrist and instead of making your hand go up and down, you make your hand go side to side while holding it in front of you. That is when your bones are actually gliding over each other. Likewise, also with your um, saddle joints, these are the joints that you would see in your hands, in your palm. And when you want to pull your fingers together to grasp something, so you want to hold a pen, that is when the saddle joint happens. And as you can see by the diagram, you can see one bone, the pink bone, and the blue bone are sliding over each other. And it allows for your bones to move inwards. It also gives your hands uh, tremendous flexibility because your hands can be quite squished together and the bones don't rub up against each other. And that's because of the saddle joint. Now, as always, I like to finish off my videos with a terminology recap, and you can use these terms to formulate your flashcards when studying. So we began with looking at cartilage and the cartilage at the end of long bones, and we find the cartilage on the epiphysis, which is the ends of the bone. We then also found at the end of the bone, the red bone marrow, which is where we make red blood cells, and it is has the consistency of spongy bone, which is bone that's more porous. We then move down into the longer part of the bone, called the diaphysis, and the longer part of the bone is made out of compact bone, so there's less pores and holes in it, and wrapping the entire bone together in order to create moisture and also to protect the bone is the periosteum, it's the outermost layer of the bone. Then if we cut into the bone itself, there was the endosteum, and the endosteum is the inner membrane followed by the yellow bone marrow that sits in the shaft of the main part of the bone. Then what we did is we zoomed in even closer to what does a bone look like in the macroscopic, well, from the macroscopic to the microscopic level, and we spoke about an osteon. An osteon are those concentric circles that we can see, and it's also known as a Harvesian system. This is part of the bone that gives it structure. It's basically where bone actually grows from, and what is actually growing these osteons is the osteocytes. Those are the bone cells. They sit in a uh, lucana, which is like a hole and they secrete out the minerals and the matrix in order to create bone itself. And they sit in concentric circles uh, around each other like rings of a tree, and we call those rings the lamellae. And right in the center of an osteon is going to be a central canal where we find blood vessels. Now, as always, if you've liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and turn your notifications on because I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday, and I will see you all again soon. Bye.